All right, hello, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Laptop Cinema Club. I am very excited to bring to you today, um, to your Zoom home theaters, um, two phenomenally talented women, Dana Fox and Lorraine Scafari. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, for people who don't know, I am Ebony Adams. I'm the manager of public programs. I'm the face that you are seeing on 90% of these women in film webinars right now. If that is a problem, you should definitely write in and we will get some co-hosts um, <laughs> in the mix. But for right now, it's me. Um, and I would like to shout out some people who helped me put this conversation together um, because this tonight's online hang is one that I've been excited about uh, for a while. So I do want to lift up some thanks to uh, Gina Pence and Ralph Gallagher from Apple. Um, I also want to thank Allison Rao and Tamara Sutton from Anchor Media Strategy. Thank you all so much um, for, for helping us put this together. Here at Women in Film, we are really passionate about celebrating um, the work of talented female filmmakers. Um, so we're just very grateful uh, for the partners who help us make these kind of conversations possible. Um, I will introduce Lorraine and Dana to you in just a moment, um, but before I do, I just want to go over a little housekeeping. So um, for those, you know, maybe two of you who have not been on nonstop video calls for the past however long, um, you will notice that your audio and video is turned off throughout tonight's uh, webinar, but we still absolutely want you to engage with, um, with what's going on. So please use the chat. Um, to talk about the conversation that's happening. But if you have a question, please use the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And that's where I'm gonna be looking when it's time for the audience Q&A. Um, so again, please use the chat just to, chat, to, to talk, um, but please use that Q&A specifically for any questions you have for Lorraine or for Dana. Um, we will take as many questions as we can before uh, we wrap up, so. Um, and then just so you know, after I introduce Lorena and Dana, I'm going to cut off my audio and video so I can just listen to all of the great stuff that they have to say and then I'll pop um, back in like a shitty jack-in-the-box uh, to my <laughs> Q&A when it's, when it's time to do that. So um, tonight, tonight's special guest, I am absolutely delighted uh, to introduce to you. Dana Fox is a writer, executive producer, and showrunner for Home Before Dark the new Apple Plus show about a young girl from the big city who uncovers clues to an unsolved cold case after her family returns to her father's small lakeside town. She's a writer and producer known for Ben and Kate, Couples Retreat, How to Be Single, and What Happens in Vegas, as well as her work as a producer on New Girl. Lorraine Scafari is a writer, actor, singer, and director. Screenwriting credits include Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, and The Meddler, the latter two of which she also directed. Uh, her most recent writing directing one two punch you all know 2019's razor sharp sex worker positive frequently hilarious one of the best films of 2019 hustlers uh, which was based on the 2015 article the hustlers is scores by jessica pressler uh, everyone watching i'm delighted to introduce to you dana and Lorreen. thank you so much for being here i'm going to turn off my video and let you talk Thank I'm realizing, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And I'm realizing it's going to be so hard for me to not be just smiling the entire time because I love Lorene so much. <laughs> and I miss her and we can't see each other in real you. life. I miss you. Hi. It's nice to see your face. It's nice to see your human face. I miss you. I miss your dog. I miss everything <laughs> about you. <laughs> they will they will make an appearance, I'm sure. Uh, oh, it's I really love them. Well, thank you for doing this, Lorene. Uh, thank you for spending the next how many ever minutes we have trying to prevent me from talking about how much I love you for the entire time and talking about how incredible your movies are. Yeah, no, we are going to focus on uh, your wonderful show, Home Before Dark, my new favorite show. And um, I'm just very excited for you. I'm just going to say that right now. This is fully biased, um, but <laughs> but it is a really incredible show. So congrats and congrats to everybody involved. And I'm, I'm really excited just to just to hear about how the the story found you, how it how it came about. Um, if you can you can bring us back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, so our incredible uh, producer Joy Gorman, who's a dear friend of ours, who's actually produced some of your work as well. Um, she 
mm, she was at a Tribeca Disruptors Award, I think it was, and there were a bunch of adults accepting awards for being change makers. And um, up walks this little nine-year-old girl who was there to an accept to an accept an award, and um, you know she was just incredible. She wanted to be a journalist ever since she was a little kid. She was incredibly um, thoughtful. She cared about the truth and she didn't take any shit from anybody. And Joy just thought this little girl was amazing and started talking to her parents and um, ended up in sort of a uh, kind of a, she, she was trying to get the, the life rights to tell this story. And there were a bunch of really, really amazing producers and they were all also trying to get her life rights to tell this story. Um, and they were all, you know, ballers. And Joy ended up getting the rights. And um, after the fact, you know, Joy said, oh, you know, there were a lot of really amazing people that we were, uh, that I was up against as well. And, you know, how did you decide to choose me? And her parents said, you know, we chose you because you were the only person who spoke directly to Hildy. You were the only person that asked her any questions that ever, uh, that realized that you were actually talking only to her and not us. Um, and everybody else apparently just talked to Hildy's parents on these phone calls. And they just thought that was so strange because they take their daughter so seriously. And it's sort of second nature to them to, to treat her like that. But no one else in, in earth does. <laughs> so when yeah. they found Joy, they sort of knew they had the right person. Um, and then Joy immediately brought it to me because I, as you know, was a super dork as a child. Um, and I was like a little like, man, I got my Philo facts when I was in first grade. And my parents were like, what are your appointments? You're in first grade. I was like, back off. I got a whole thing going on. I'm working on my stuff, my work. Um, so I've always been like a little workaholic ever since I was a little kid. And I couldn't understand why the world wasn't treating me more seriously when I was Hildy's age. Um, so I really responded to that aspect of it. And then, um, you know, the part of it that really got me, because I couldn't figure out how to turn that into a story that I really wanted to tell. I think you, Lorraine, you're so good at kind of knowing that you need to have a really deep personal connection to the material that you're doing. Um, and I think I learned that from you and through John Chu, who had such a deeply personal connection to Crazy Rich Asians. And, you know, I... I I really felt like I needed a deeply personal connection to this material in order to be like, why is it me who has to tell this story? And when you hear a little girl sort of like journalist or plucky detective or whatever, you sort of think kids show. I never liked watching those shows when I was a kid. Definitely don't want to watch them now. Definitely don't want to write them now. Um, so I was trying to find my way in and I couldn't really figure out what it was. And in my free time, I was listening to these true crime podcasts like serial and I was binging these like incredibly dark sort of cold case mystery podcasts um, and all that was swirling around in my head and um, I was also working on Cruella with Emma Stone at Disney and I was kind of thinking about how movies are frequently four quadrant affairs you know you can have a movie that uh, older people younger people all these people really really want to watch um, at the same time and that the movie speaks to them in different ways and so I kept thinking, why haven't I seen that on television? This is weird. When I was a kid, I would sit on my couch and I would watch E.T. Close Encounters, Jaws with my family. And I was trying to get back that feeling. Um, but I still didn't really have my way in until um, I talked with Joy uh, to Hildy and her father one day. And we kind of got a little bit more into the real story because people had heard of Hildy originally because she scoop the local paper on a murder in her small town. And so that was sort of all I had known about her in the beginning. I thought, well, that's incredible, but still that wasn't quite my way in. Um, and when I spoke to Matt and Hildy, what I learned was that her father at the time um, that that happened had been reporting on some really, really depressing um, news, like a really tough, really dark news story. And he was disaffected with journalism, the way that everything had to be clickbait and the fact that nobody seemed to care about the truth. And this story was really, really dark, a lot of death involved in it, and he got depressed. And so he just took his entire family and he moved them away from New York City. He quit his job. He was like, I'm done. I'm not a journalist anymore. I can't do this anymore. And he moved to this small town that he was from, his hometown, and basically started homeschooling his children and didn't leave the house much. And Hildy, when they got there, 
you know, she had started this little newspaper when she was a child and she'd always loved it and her parents had always supported her. But she was kind of like, well, look, just because you're not a journalist anymore doesn't mean that I'm not a journalist. And that's when she started going out and looking for stories and that's when she broke the murder. And it was the fact that when she got all these negative comments and she didn't back down, she just stood up for herself. She name checked the people who had made the negative comments. She put a video online of all of them and just kind of like, F you to the whole world and watching her not give up and watching her have this pure love of journalism is what brought her father out of his depression, made him want to come back to journalism. And so that part of it, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm, I'm so in, like, that is a story I really, really want to tell. Um, I think on some level, you know, I, there's this very, very powerful urge to kind of like you know, save your father, say, or just there's this intense energy there and, and whatever your father means to you, your father. Um, it's like, for me, it means my Wars. father. So <laughs> very direct. <laughs> exactly. It's your actual father. <laughs> but yeah, it's that, it's that thing. It's what they made all the Star Wars movies about. You know what I'm saying? Um, so <laughs> it was this very primal, very, uh, kind of universal emotional thing at the core of the story. And it allowed me to do this other thing that I was really excited about, which was, you know, all of those movies I grew up watching on the couch with my family, they all were about men or boys. And of course I loved them. I was like, they're amazing. You know, like I want to be Indiana Jones, you know, of course, but I really wanted to see a female protagonist, a young female protagonist. And I wanted to give just sort of like, I wanted to know that you could give a little girl as big of a stage as any big movie star man would get. And yeah. um, it felt really important to me because we were at a time, you know, back then we didn't know what the world was gonna look like. And I think we understood that like fake news was starting to become an idea, um, but we could tell that there was something really important about if you, if you can't really know the truth, then we're all lost you know, then the, if it, the truth has to be knowable. Um, so that was something I really was excited to talk about through this young girl character. And I wanted to take her really seriously. I wanted to take her as seriously as all of the little girls in my life who are such ballers. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just kind of, it went yeah, there. it really, I mean, it's it, so much of it is about the relationships that we have. Um, but I think that is also what a, a big part of it is, is our relationship with the truth. We each have a different relationship with, with that. And um, I think, you know, Hildy inspires so much in her father and, and this thing that he seemed to bury so deep um, that is reemerging um, sometimes you know, uh, maybe at the wrong time or at the seemingly worst time, but, um, but, uh, you know, reigniting that passion in him and, and that, that desire for the truth. I, I find that really compelling. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you touch on something that is, was a real challenge in the show. I mean, I would say the hardest thing about the show was figuring out how to do the tone in a way that was kind of what, I had in my head and what I knew I wanted, it, it was very difficult to talk about because it's not something that, um, it, it's funny, it's like, it's not something I'd ever seen before, so I couldn't point directly at it. It, it was a lot of different things, um, but it was something kind of new. Uh, it, I wanted it to have a nostalgic feel, so I wanted parents to see it and connect to, the, to their own childhood. And I wanted kids to see the parental stories and connect to them because you were flashing back to the parents as kids. I wanted to use 80s music because that's what I grew up with and I was like, that's just awesome. And then I wanted to cover that sometimes with actual new artists so that the parents were like, oh, I love this song. And the kids are like, what a delightful new song by that new modern day artist. So there were a lot of different things I was, I was kind of trying to get into and the tone was very tricky because of the thing that you're saying, which is like, how do you create stakes in a show where Fundamentally, it's not, I didn't want to see a show where I was genuinely worried about the children being hurt. Like, I, I was kind of like, I, I, I'm a mother, I have three kids. I, like, even when I wasn't a mother, I was like, oh, I don't like to watch kids be in trouble. It's, it's, I want them, I want them to be in trouble, but I don't want to worry that they're going to get actually physically hurt in any way. Um, so how do you find the stakes if that's one of the constraints that you have? And 
one of the ways in which we did that was by having it be that the kids didn't really know what they were, how serious what they were getting into was. So Hildy's going like, I got to find the truth. I got to find the truth. And that's what the real Hildy is like. She is such a steamroller. She's like, she's sort of at a younger age, she kind of didn't care at what cost. It was like, I got to find the truth. It doesn't matter who it hurts. We got to go because the truth is the most important thing. And I was really interested in watching the adults around her kind of freak out and go like, don't, don't go in there. Don't go into that closet. You know, because that's, one of the things we do as adults is we sort of lower our bar for what truth we're willing to take. And we, we say, I, you know what, I don't actually want that much truth. It's really exhausting. It's really hard. Um, so this girl is kind of like wandering in and with her flashlight, she's going like, well, let's look at this old family secret and let's see who didn't, who disappointed who. And then you cut to the adults really freaking out and you know, there are actually stakes to it. It's like, yeah, yeah, she doesn't even realize how much danger she might be in because she doesn't realize how serious those secrets are to the adults. Right, right. Of course. I mean, it, uh, I mean, that is the sort of uh, bliss of a, being maybe a certain age and, and uh, I don't know, maybe we get a little less brave as we get older, you know, and, and, uh, and, yeah. and kids, kids could kind of remind us of, of that sometimes. Um, but I think you really balance that tone really well, the, the, the sort of thrills of a mystery and the, and the drama that can unfold with a family in a town and, and all of these people grappling with um, their different relationships with the truth and their different relationships with, with each other. Um, and, and of course, you know, grounded with, with Hildy and, and Matt. Um, how did you find Brooklyn Prince? I mean, I, I you know, oh I, 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 I love uh, Florida Project, obviously. And she's incredible. But to be able to build a show around a nine-year-old, I'm not, is that how old she was when you she, started? It's so, much, it's so much worse than that. She was eight years old for the entire first season. Wow. Like she, she was so tiny. And like, you forget, I like that. I, I used to love doing this thing in the editing room where you would go through this whole scene where she was sort of being this like incredible, powerful force. And then I would go like, okay, let's cut super wide. And then you would see this tiny baby at the end of a hall, just crying because her sister hurt her feelings. And you're like, oh, she's a baby. Like she's tiny. And you forget about that. And it was yeah. really important to me that you remind the audience a few times this is really actually a child. This is, you know, I felt like since I was really trying to do something I'd never seen before, I felt like I had seen a lot of shows where the child at the center of it is kind of basically just an adult. You know, it's like, it, I, well, I've never actually watched it, but you know, like a young Sheldon or like a, you know, there's a Doogie Hauser sort of thing. And, and, and you're kind of like, I knew I didn't want her to be that because I had seen that before. Um, what I hadn't seen before is a little girl who was like a superhero for just working hard, not because she can shoot laser out, lasers out of her eyes or light things on fire. Um, but you know, just for being a girl and that she could express these emotions. And initially when I was uh, working on the character with Dara Resnick and Joy Gorman, you know, I personally struggled with, I couldn't figure out how to get deeper into the Hildy character because the real Hildy is very analytical. She's very um, black and white. She's all about the truth. She's like incredibly sort of uh, truth-based and fact-based. And I'm like an emotional mess. Like I'm like crying over this. And I mean, you know, I was like, I'd like to cry. I feel the emotions. I'm, I got a huge heart. So, I, you know, I, I personally, when I watch things, especially television, not always movies, but especially television, I'm not looking for a specific story when I go to figure out what I want to watch. I'm looking for a feeling. Like I want to feel something specific. And um, with this character, I wanted, I knew I wanted to feel really emotional. And Hildy was not, she's not an emotional person. And so I was, I was really struggling to figure out like, okay, how do I, how do I, Dana, and, you know, there are a lot of people that make these, the, this project, it's a hugely collaborative effort, but how do I, Dana, get really into this character to, to the point where I know that I can write this character forever. And it wasn't until I met Brooklyn Prince that I figured that out fully, honestly. Um, and it was because Brooklyn was so emotional. She's such an empathetic child. And, you know, we had all heard from Joy about the Florida Project because Joy Gorman, our incredible producer, she's like Cassandra. She always knows the answer like two and a half years before everybody else. And then she sort of says that. 
and you go, yeah, yeah, Joy, hold on, just give me a minute, I gotta figure this thing out. And then two years later, you come around to Joy's exact thing that she said two years ago. It's a little exhausting for her, I imagine. Um, but she was like, Brooklyn Prince, the Florida Project, she's the only person who can play this part. We have to get this girl. And I had not seen the Florida Project because I was too busy trying to make this television show. And I was so exhausted and I had three young children and I was, I was just sort of like, I hadn't seen the movie. And, you know, Joy kept saying, no, this is the only girl that can do it. It's the only girl that can do it. And then we went to try to get her and she was, you know, this is going to sound like, oh, she's some sort of Hollywoody star. This is not at all. This is like the best girl on the planet, but her family and she were not really like talking to people about television because, you know, to be a child, you have to sort of, you have to um, kind of, uh, you have to come out of school. You have to move your whole family. It's a whole thing. So they didn't want to commit to a really large time because they wanted to commit to a smaller thing. A movie is like, you know, generally whatever, 30 days or something of a commitment and that they felt they could make as a family. Um, but we just sort of kept begging and begging them to just read the script, read the script, because we knew that there was something special here because there just, there couldn't be more material like this because this is, you know, this, she's the star of the show and we take her incredibly seriously. So they, thankfully they read the script and they loved the script and they were like, oh, okay, we get it. Like this is 10 small movies and this takes this girl really seriously. And this is like sort of a, let's change the world by showing a young girl protagonist kind of story. And so they were on board. So they came to do a, um, a FaceTime audition and it was me and John Chu and Dara and Joy and our incredible casting director, Rachel Penner. And, you know, Brooklyn started doing her bit and she had all, you know, of course she had all of her lines memorized because she's like some weird, crazy thing that she can memorize lines. I can't memorize two sentences. This girl is like pages of dialogue. She's got this. Um, and she starts doing the scene. And I think it was the scene in the cafeteria where she stands up on the table. And I think it was the other scene was the one where her father yells at her and says, can't you just be a little kid for once in your life? And she gets emotional. And, you know, she did the emotional scene. and. I just sort of like, cause you know, you're supposed to like play your cards close to the vest and you know that I'm terrible at that. Like nobody likes to wear their heart on their sleeve more than I am. So I, she's doing this scene, it's super emotional. And I just like went like, I like leaned up like super slowly, just leaned off character and started like hysterically crying and then like wiped my tears and then just like leaned back on. I was like, right on Brooklyn, good job. Like you wanna do the next scene? Cool, cool. <laughs> but I was like weeping uncontrollably off just the side of the screen. and. You know, it was just, it was revelatory for me, to be honest with you, seeing someone, I, I mean, forget her age. She's one of the best actresses I've ever worked with. It, it was like, I think what it is with Brooklyn is, you know, you worry about kids like working. And what I feel about Brooklyn is she's very much like the real Hildy, which is like when Hildy went to a crime scene with her father when she was very, very young. Her father thought, oh, I can just take her because we don't have a babysitter and she's so young, she'll never know what's going on. She'll never know that I took my small child to a you know, murder scene in the Bronx. And instead of not understanding it, Hildy was like a fish who found her water. You know, it was like wide eyed and just like, I'm home, you know? And Brooklyn is sort of the same way when she's working, which is that she's such a deeply empathetic person and she has such an imagination. She's such a nice, wonderful kid who really wants to understand how other people feel and wants to imagine feeling what they would feel. So I don't think in normal life, she gets a chance to actually like emote as much as she wants to. Um, and, you know, that's something that's so interesting about watching her perform is that you don't talk about, I mean, I've had some of the most sophisticated conversations with her about scenes. Like it, it's, it's weird to me because sometimes she'll go, oh, you know, what I realized is so sad about this is that Hildy's trying not to cry because she knows it's going to make her seem weak, but really it's her dad she's worried about, not herself. And you're like, oh God, yes, oh, that's <laughs> yeah. right. And it's like, I didn't even think about it that way, but you're right. That is actually what's going on underneath this. So yeah. when she forces when she, you to take it seriously, which I think is exactly what that that you know role wants, without without her, you know, she's still a kid and she's still up against a lot of kids stuff and other kids. But like you know, I think because Brooklyn obviously is so bright and um, and uh, tapped in, you know, and and um, 
that well, you're and you're sh- watching her instead of like when it's an adult actor, you're watching them try to get themselves in a headspace so that they can um, show you what a feeling would look like. Brooklyn is just feeling the feeling on camera, and you happen to be there recording it because she has so fully digested, and and only the best actors can really do that, and actresses. It's like she's fully digested what the character would be going through in that moment. And the thing that's occurring in front of you is her having the feeling. So a lot of the adult actors on the show, like they say that, you know, they, they get so teary eyed off camera. They're like so emotional with Brooklyn because she's so present and she's feeling the feelings. Yeah. And so yeah. they have Bringing all felt the best like they, of them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly I mean, they're right. all so great. And I mean, the relationship between her and, and, uh, and, and Madge and Sturgis, uh, I mean, Sturgis. The, the dynamic they have is so beautiful. Um, and looks like it comes really naturally for them. I, I'm wondering, Oh my you God, know, they're so in love. Yeah. It's so cute. Sure. They love each other so much. They're so sweet. I mean, I, I, with a show like this where you, you, you have such, you know, there's a plotting, there's, a, there's so much for you to, to juggle and follow, obviously. Um, how much can they, you know, kind of play on set in order to, to find that energy? And, or did they have it they, right away? Um, you know. It's funny because they, they had that energy the second they met each other. You know, we flew Jim Sturgis from London because he's British. He does a really convincing American accent, but he's British. He, he's like the dreamy guy from across the universe, British guy. And we flew him here and basically because we wanted to see a chemistry read. And it, it was really interesting to me. This is just sort of a sidebar, which is it was, it was incredibly disappointing to me. And yet it was fuel to my fire that so many male actors refused to chemistry read with Brooklyn. Like, I think they felt it was either, I think they felt it was beneath them. Um, and they, they were like, wait, I'm not going to try to prove myself to some little girl, you know? And it was like, whoa, buddy. Like you have to convincingly be father and daughter. Like we just have to see that you look like father and daughter together, that you have that energy together. Um, she could be taller very, than you, you know, I, I <laughs> never know. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But it was really, it was disappointing to um, see how many men were doing the exact thing that is why I wanted to make the show, which is people underestimate little girls all the time. And, you know, we, there was a moment where we had someone say, you know, I don't think that this little girl can do what you guys think she can do. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy we're making this show because boy, does that make me mad. And it just, it was really, really disappointing. And then Sturgis, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because he's British or amazing or uh, came from a theater background. He was like, oh my God, what a, what an honor to uh, chemistry read with the girl from the Florida Project. She's extraordinary. I wouldn't, I would love to, please. So he flies over here and um, within seven seconds of meeting each other, it was like, we were all looking at each other like, is he her actual dad? Like what is going on? They had this incredible chemistry with each other and they're just goofballs and Jim is very playful and, um, and he, you know, it uh, just loved finding moments with her. So John Chu worked with them and it was just awesome to let them sort of play. He said, John Chu said, hey, go into the other room, go make up some handshakes, go tell each other a couple stories about blah, 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 and then come back. And, and so they sort of came back with this like improv that they had done. And um, by, you know, by the time they were one minute into it, I was like, get the, how do we get the British guy to say yes to the show? Like he was so great with her. That's and funny. so the, the only thing about them on set is that they are playful and they do love to play and find certain moments, but because of the sort of uh, difficulty of shooting with a lot of children and the way that that really holds you back scheduling wise, um, because the children as well, they should are in school for a lot of the day and they, they don't work very many hours in a given day because they're children and they shouldn't. So it's, <laughs> It's morally a good awesome. Yeah, it's morally <laughs> awesome. It's a good thing. And as a mother, I really support it. As a showrunner, I'm like, oh boy, they just got yanked out of here real quick. Um, so <laughs> it's a little tricky to try to find ways. I mean, you know, to try to find ways to get through the scenes. Uh, and we're so lucky that Brooklyn really frequently has her lines just like perfect. Uh, Kylie, her older sister, is like a secret assassin. She just nails it every take and every take she's good and done. And it's just amazing. 
and um, the adults are incredibly giving and they understand that sometimes they're going to have to shoot like the majority of Brooklyn stuff and then go do another scene with just Brooklyn and then come back and shoot like the side of right. their scene. So they're incredibly nurturing and giving. Abby Miller, who's amazing, um, who plays the mom. And, you know, she's that wonderful. part of it. What she, so, oh. she brings so much. And, and, you know, I mean, the character is so wonderful too. And, and um, you know, it's, it's great to see a relationship between a, a family, a husband, a wife, a mom, a, a you know, a daughter and, and all the interpersonal relationships. She's just, she's wonderful. Um, oh, really I gifted. I love her. I used to just play her screen test over and over again for myself for pleasure. Cause it was like, you know, just watching a woman who crushed like a seventies movie. Like what I knew I wanted again, the casting, I, I always sort of forget to talk about the casting, but the casting was like my full-time job for a certain period when we first started working and Dara was doing all this great work in the writer's room to get the scripts ahead of where we were. And I was really focusing very hard on casting because it was, in my opinion, what was going to make or break us. You know, the fact that we found Brooklyn was like an absolute miracle. And then everybody had to be as good as her, which is crazy. And she's right. very natural. So you had to have people that felt very real and felt very much in the world and like incredibly sort of um, granular, real people. Um, and so I made casting my full-time job and finding Abby, the mom, was really exciting because I knew I wanted it, again, to feel like those 70s movie moms or, you know, just, or like the mom in Close Encounters and not like a broadcast, you know, sitcom mom. That was never going to work. Um, and then every single part, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, um, as a writer, I'm a big believer that a good actor is the most important thing you can possibly find. And so you should tailor the part to the actor if you can. It's like you start off and you want to find the thing that you had in your head. But for me, I always end up going like, well, screw what I had in my head. Like, that's not important. What's important is what, what is the best person I could possibly find who's going to excite me and inspire me and make me want to write more to them. And so I basically did that with all of the characters. You know, it's like when we found uh, Aziza Scott, who plays Trip. Um, you know, that part was initially very serious. She was like a dead serious, like lady cop who was just like super by the books. And she was, you know, supposed to be this sort of tight person. And Aziza came in and did almost like a comedic performance. And it was like, Hildy, are you kidding? Like, lady, step down, like, chill out, you know? And she started making fun of Brooklyn. And it was so funny to me because... I realized that's what the audience is going to be thinking about this show. So a lot of times I think it's important that if there's a criticism that you can feel coming from the audience, you figure out a way to have the world say that same criticism and then the audience won't have it anymore. So Aziza, you know, Aziza's character is constantly making fun of Hildy and being like, is there a turn, is there an off button for you? And like, you know, you're a child and you're ridiculous, right? Like this is real <laughs> stupid, right? And so if you just have a character say it, then anybody who's thinking it in the audience is like, well, I mean, all right, okay. I'm still watching the show. I'm still enjoying the show. Well, yeah, she's wonderful. Their dynamic is so, is so great. It's, it's nice to have the, you know, someone on the inside too. I mean, that, that really goes a long way. And, um, and, uh, and also, I mean, it's as, a, it's oh a God, family. So good. You know, you're, you're creating a family. I mean, with a TV show, it really is a, a long-term relationship, you know, and oh my God, um, yes. not, it's so not scary so too. Cause there. Well, yeah. And you know that you can sort of like withstand anything over the course of a movie because you're like, all right, I got to get through this. I can do this. And so anyone can sort of like, if there's bad behavior, you're kind of like, all right, fine. I can get through this. This can be impossible, but I'll make it. I was like, if I do this, this is years of my life. And if these people do it, it's years of their lives. And we have these precious children. Like, you know, the uh, Jabrail's incredible and Derek is incredible. Her friend's and Kylie, like, we had all these kids, and I was like, this is their actual childhood. This is not a joke. This is this is them growing up. So they're about to see yeah. the models around them on set every day. And I was like, I can't have assholes. I just can't. If there's no. one person in the show who's an asshole, the show goes away. You just quit. So um, I called a lot. It was like, I felt like it was so creepy. I felt like I was doing, like, background checks on people. But I called a lot of references for every actor that I cast. Because I was like, what if he's a dick? Like, I can't, I just can't have it. And so I called several people on each person and everybody had to get sort of like overwhelmingly good recommendations. Cause I was like, this could sink the whole thing 
Um, yeah, we gotta right. we gotta make it last. I think we're gonna open. Oh, it hi, up, you're back. Um, to the uh, to uh, the Q and A. I'm gonna. My dog has been scratching at the door for a while oh, please. now. <laughs> let in. Let's bring Life in your dog. Truth. Life and truth. Your yes. dog. Your dog has a question. I love uh, that. Which yes. dog? Okay, it was a listen. It. it was a fast, a fascinating conversation. So I'm not surprised the dog is like, I need to get in the mix. Like there's some stuff that I want to say about this show. If it's, okay, if yeah, it's Bruce, it's going to be a really good question too. If it's Bruce, let me tell you. Okay, if it's Mona, I don't know. Bruce, um, and you know, kind of a spotlight at the end. But yeah, I do want to. Um, we've got some questions here from people that I would love for, yeah, for I would to love it. um so I'm going to start just from the just from the top uh Diana hey. asks Dana will you chat about the state of feature comedy development and production for women writers over the past few oh. years and your oh. view has it been changing if at all Lily, um you know for yes I think it I think it always changes I think it continues to change and I think Lorraine can speak to this as well um I uh, I went for me personally, when uh, our president was elected, things started to not be funny to me anymore. And I was really struggling with it. I was really having a hard time finding things that would make me laugh. Um, and I didn't really feel like that funny. I didn't really feel like I wanted to laugh. Um, so I was sort of lucky that I was working on something, which is this show that made me feel like I was doing something I really believed in that had a good message about truth and um, the importance of truth and all that and journalism and the attacks on journalism that was happening around me was sort of shocking. Um, so I felt really lucky I had something I could throw myself into that felt like that. And I, and I would say that um, for me, all good comedy always came from pain. I always thought that it was like, I I for, I don't write jokes very well, like set up punchline, set up punchline. It's just not my thing. There's a million people who are better at it than I am. Katie Silverman, genius. Um, a lot of writers that I met who were really good at it. And so I think what I am good at is that I like characters. I like people. I like people who, because of who they are, and they take themselves really seriously, it is funny for the audience to watch them do that. Um, so that was something that was, interesting to me. And so I think if I do kind of try to return to this comedy space, and I do a lot of um, script doctor work, you know, that I, where I'm not credited on comedies, and I come in and I, I kind of look at them very holistically. And I always think, you know, you can have a comedy roundtable to make something really funny, but if the movie story doesn't work, and if you don't care about the characters, all the comedy in the world is like, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so I do work in comedy still, but, um, you know, it, it wasn't a uh, I just started to feel like there were people around me who do it better than I do. And I was like, I want to help them do it. Um, you know, you get to a certain point in your life and you're just, I, the, the success of other people and of my friends and of other people around me or people who are trying to get their start, like actually brings me way more joy than my own success. Um, like, you know, Lorene's movie Hustlers was like the best thing that has ever happened to me. <laughs> like, I got to see the movie early with her and at some point I just like leaned over to her. I'm like clutching my milk duds and I just like leaned over to her and I'm like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. <laughs> and it was so, I, I enjoyed the experience of watching Lorene's success more than anything that has ever happened to me. I didn't have to get dressed up. I didn't have to go get my picture taken. I just had to watch her do it. It was amazing. And I didn't have to work so hard. I didn't have to make the movie. Um, so I really love like, you know, I think maybe I'll move into the producing space, but you know, just, I think my advice, if the question is sort of like, what is going on with the business? My advice is like, don't ever chase the business because nothing good ever comes from chasing the business. Chase what your personal gut is telling you you have to do. And if you have to do a comedy that stars a woman, do it because that's what you're going to be the best at. Um, and don't ever let anybody tell you that it's not going to work or the business isn't into it. You know, there's a whole period of time where nobody wanted rom-coms and a rom-com was successful. Everybody wanted rom-coms again. You know, there's a whole period of time where everybody said like women aren't funny. And it's like, well, that's bullshit. So forget it. So, you know, and then you have Fleabag, which is just so brilliant. And, you know, that broke a lot of rules. That was not like nothing anybody had ever really seen before. Um, I watched the show Catastrophe. I love that show. I mean, so I think if you just say to yourself, I'm not chasing the business. I don't care what's popular, what's not popular. Um, right from your gut and your heart, 
And then people will respond to that because the thing that I think people respond to the most in the business is, is you being passionate and you saying like, I'm going to work so hard for this thing because I'm so passionate about it. Um, and then even if you can't get that movie going, somebody will hire you to do something else because they see that spark inside of that thing that you wrote. Lorraine, is that a good, I don't know. What do you, do you what do you think, Lorraine? I was muted. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, we're talking about is, has it changed uh, over time as far as women in, in comedy, I guess, you know, like I don't really, I, I haven't worked in a lot of television enough to know what that space is like. I'm usually like alone in a room for two years before I being. I think the question like, was about movies. That's why I'm putting it to you. Cause now I'm only in the TV space and we're in the movie. Oh space. gosh. I mean, like feature movie comedies for women. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what's weird is, you know, I, I mean, what's weird is just, I guess the word female in front of the kind of any job is is like inherently weird, and, um, you know, the the sort of spotlight that that there is on it now. I think I think there's been so much progress though, and I think, um, uh, you know, so obviously we got rid of some like demons in the room and and kind of exercise them a bit and and certain sort of egregious behavior is i suppose not not tolerated anymore but i think we also have a long way to go in terms of um in terms of like uh the kinds of stories that are 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 viewed cinematically and um you know like it feeling like a subset of humanity rather than like the human experience. So I think, I think there's like uh, a ways to go and, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in kind of tackling the root of something rather than just like the leaves that it, you know, come out of the end of it. But, uh, but I, I think, you know, I think we've really made a lot of progress and I, and I, and I do just fully agree with in general, like you know, everybody has a voice, everybody has a story, everybody has something to say. And um, if it's something that feels inherently funny, and I, I certainly get a lot of, I, uh, you know, comedy from pain, like Dana said, I, I enjoy tapping into almost what isn't really funny about being a woman <laughs> tends to kind of bring out what's just funny about all of us kind of operating in this weird world with weird values and you know kind of this broken system and everything so um i think there are ways to view that comedically i think ways to view it dramatically i think um you know there's obviously we need we need entertainment now also you know we could we all could use a laugh certainly and um i'll be curious to see how how moving forward we can keep pushing those voices while you know um we're all kind of navigating this this new space too. So it's interesting, you know, those questions are still so important and 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 um, you know, and we're and we're, but we're like kind of swimming in mm -hmm. new waters too. Mm -hmm. Is that dark? Is that all too dark for us? Uh, no, not not at all. I think <laughs> like giving that was, realistic that was actually us trying to be positive. <laughs> right. No, I think <laughs> like, you know what's crucial is that you are, you know, two people actually working in the industry right now. So realistic answers. Um, that's that's what people are looking for, you know. I think you know we can paint this kind of utopian vision of you know anyone can do whatever, but without preparing people for the realities of what they're going to face and giving them the tools, you know, to kind of address them, we're we're doing them a disservice. Um, so I yeah, do think it's a nice time for that, though. I think you know everybody I've been talking to is really feeling like you know uh, reaching out and wanting to mentor and and mm -hmm. looking to you know have these kinds of dialogues and mm -hmm. uh you know put on a jacket and pretend you left the house but like yeah, exactly. I, think, I think that it is also you know about connecting and about um you know talking about what 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 connects us and um i you know it's all it it, it is ultimately about uh lifting each other up Certainly. I also Absolutely. think that this particular time period, I'm sure there are a lot of writers, you know, who are hopefully listening and who will listen. You know, I think one of the things that was special for me about this particular TV show is that I think I did it for all the right reasons. 
Mm-hmm. Like everyone in my life was telling me not to do it. <laughs> they were like, you're going to make seven cents. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be really hard. You're going to work all the time. You have three children. They're all very young. You're never going to see them again. You better hope that they have a nice time trying to get themselves to college because mm-hmm. you're never going to talk to them again. And, you know, everybody told me not to do it um, because it didn't seem like an obvious home run. Mm-hmm. And um, I just didn't give into that. I didn't care. I just was like, ah, I just love it. And I had the chance to, I, Joy was trying to get me to do this for a year and to constantly think, Dana, you've got to help. you got to really dial in on this now. you got to do it if you're going to do it. Or, and then she basically said, you got to shit or get off the pot. You have to do it or I have to give it to another writer. And that called my bluff because I was like, don't give it to anybody else. It's mine. I love it. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that until you threatened to take it. Um, so I think that this is a really good time because you, you may feel like no one's going to buy anything right now in this exact moment. And you're sitting in your house and you're thinking, how am I going to get sort of motivated to do something? Try something that you've never done before that you've always wanted to do. You know, a lot of people were like, what are you doing? Doing like a mystery drama. You're a comedy writer. And I'm like, am I? I'm just like a person who's never tried this before. (laughs) So, you know, I just sort of... Yeah, and I had I had a lot of help. I had a lot. I collaborated with Dara. She was amazing. I mean, I just think like, just try a thing that you've never tried before. Push in that direction. Push yourself to do something that you don't necessarily think is going to be something that is going to sell or be amazing. And I did it because I just loved it. Um, and then it actually became something I'm the most proud of of everything I've ever done. Uh, so it's a it's a time to try that stuff. Maybe. It is definitely a time to try that stuff. And I, I wouldn't rule out people's interest. You know, I think that, I think it's actually, um, you know, a time when people are reading and, and, and interested in stories and, and, you know, we're all looking ahead to when production is up and running again. And, and so I think people actually are, you know, it's certainly a good time if, if you're lucky enough to be indoors right now and, um, you know, it's a good time to write, certainly, and and talk to people and connect with people and watch things like this and, you know, maybe get inspired and watch movies and TV shows and get inspired. But I wouldn't rule out even people people's interest in, in buying it at, at this moment, you know, because we're, we're obviously hoping to be on the other side of this and, and uh, you know, kind of launching it into the next thing so if you can keep your head straight and you know I mean you obviously don't have to put that kind of pressure on yourself either you know but um if if it's a good you know if the creative juices are flowing it's certainly I think a good time yeah personally I can barely do my own laundry right now so it's been a challenge but uh but yeah someday maybe I'll be productive again yeah exactly (laughs) So one of the things that I really loved um, listening to the two of you talk about was how you take um, Brooklyn, Hildy, seriously. Um, you, you pay her that respect, both as a character and as an actor, but you don't treat her like a little adult. Like there is something fundamentally different about an eight or a nine year old, um, no matter how self-possessed, no matter how smart, um, you know, no matter how driven, there is something different. And I, I love the way that you talked about how you were able to honor that and how it, you know, really, um, you know, made everyone's performances richer and made the story move. And so to that end, um, unfortunately, we only have time for, for one more question. So I, to that end, I wanted to ask a question specifically um, about that. This is from Paige. She says, I'm sure that there are many, but what is your number one piece of advice or takeaway from working with a young uh, female actor? I'm currently developing a short that also centers around a young female protagonist. Any advice with tips on set or throughout the process would be much appreciated. I mean, I think find yourself someone who uh, has a really good work ethic. Um, Brooklyn has like the best work ethic of anyone I've ever met. Uh, And I would say use language. Language is very specific with kids. So like if you can figure out a way to tailor the words that are coming out of their mouths so that it actually is something that they would say that way, I think the performance will be better. So one of the things I learned from doing the whole first season is that if Brooklyn is using a word, even if the word isn't complicated, if she's using that word in a sophisticated sort of sentence, that it because as an adult, you sort of, you don't quite, you're not cued into that fully. You just kind of forget the way that language is complicated. 
So if, if she's using either a complicated word that she has never heard before, of course she can memorize it and she can say it, it's no problem. But you're gonna lose her for just a second. And uh, it was more important to me that I start writing to exactly how she would talk so that there was nothing in the way of the performance. So what I would do is I would take the whole script, I would do a character report, and I would just churn out all the dialogue that was just for Brooklyn, and I would send it to her amazing mother, Courtney Prince, who is uh, just the best. And I would say, read this and tell me if there's anything that bumps for you. Is there any, are there any words? Are there any turns of phrases? And she would come back with the strangest thing. She'd go, oh, Brooklyn would never say da 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 da. She would say it like this. And it was sometimes it was like a comma or a this. And she would just help me tailor it to her mouth because what you don't want is you don't want a kid memorizing lines and then pretending. Mm -hmm. You want to give them the tools to be truly fully in the moment. So I would say, don't ever be one of those writers who is precious about your words with a kid. Figure out a way to write exactly to them and your, your performance is going to just be off the charts because they're saying it the way they will feel it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. On that wonderful piece of, you know, creative advice, I'm going to wrap up for today. Thank you so much, Lorraine, Dana. This was no. phenomenal. I wish my you actual real piece of good advice for everybody in the whole business. It is. Find, it is. Yourself, find yourself a Lorraine. There's only, unfortunately, there's only one of her and she's right. super amazing, but she's uh, my best friend. And, you know, she has always helped me with everything. Anytime I've ever had a script and I've been struggling with it, I bring it to her. She reads it. She helps me. She talks it out with me. She helps me rewrite it. She helped me rewrite this pilot while my dog was dying at the actual vet. She was reading it for me because I had to hand it in and I was a basket case of sobbing and she was there with me. So my best advice is like find your people because if you have your people, then it kind of doesn't matter if you're a success or a failure in your job because you just love the person that you're with. So that's my, you're best. That's my you're actual the, best advice. You're the same for me, Dana. You're the absolute mm -hmm. same yeah. for me. And I can't wait to see you when it's not the Brady Bunch and uh, no. we're just uh, <laughs> voting heads. <laughs> It was fantastic listening to the two of you talk. Thank you so much um, to both of you. Thank you to everyone who was watching today. I'm sorry we didn't get to very many questions, but I encourage you, if you have not watched the show, it is so, so good. So use those awesome. Apple codes that we gave you. Check out the show. You will not regret it. And, um, you know, tweet about it. Hashtag home before dark. Tag Please, women. Get film. the word out. Yeah. I think I think the people watching this are literally my entire marketing plan. So there you go. Tell your there you go. <laughs> so we all, we all have know. a task. We all have something to do. So on that note, I want to say good night to everyone. Thank you both, Dana. Best of luck with the show. Can't wait for season two. And uh, so yeah, much. we will see you at the next Women in Film Laptop Cinema Club. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Home before dark. Home before yeah. dark. <laughs>